of all the religious peoples around the world, one that has been especially involved in farming, is the Mennonites. The Mennonites trace their history back to the Anabaptist movement in Switzerland in the early 1500s, when a group of young men and women began to rethink what it meant to be a Christian, that is, a follower of Christ. They concluded that it meant that you must choose to live life according to the ways of Christ, and to mark this conscious decision, they began to baptize one another as adults, giving themselves the name Anabaptists. The movement quickly spread northward from Switzerland to the Netherlands, and in 1536, a Dutch priest named Menno Simons converted to Anabaptism and became a prominent leader within the movement. His followers became known as Mennonites, and other Anabaptists who agreed with his teaching began to adopt the name as well. In these early days, many Mennonites were not farmers, but during the first 100 years, they adopted agriculture as a way of life. And as they migrated to various places around the world, they transplanted their farm communities to new areas. Today, there are over 2 million Mennonites living in 87 countries. And over the course of the next hour, we are going to look at the lives and stories of seven Mennonite farmers around the world. This is Seven Points on Earth. My name is Dave Yoder. I'm from Kelowna, Iowa. Uh, I grew up in Kelowna, Iowa in this house for 57 years, and I'm 57 years old, so I've been here <laughs> all my life. I'm um, a farmer. I raise corn, soybeans, and hogs, and also sell pioneer seed. And I'm Lisa Yoder, Dave's wife, and we've been married 32 years. Um, we have three daughters that we've raised here on the farm. It's probably the best place that you could raise children, and they yeah. would say so too. And we have two grandchildren, two on the way, and they love to be here on our farm too. Um, we think it's the best way of life. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so part of this farm is new buildings mixed with the old stuff that my dad used to have. So, like those two buildings would be an old chicken house and a machine shed Dad would have had. We converted the machine shed into a shop. The bin is something new that we made about three years ago. It holds, holds corn, 25,000 bushel of corn. Um, seed shed is fairly, part of it's two years old and part of it's about 25 years old. So that's something my brother and I made. Nama saya Hadi Bitoyo. Berasal dari Margorejo. Saya sedikit akan menjelaskan tentang pertanian saya. Uh, saya uh, mengerjakan sawah uh, seorang bos dan saya mendapat hasil 30%-nya dan Saya juga beternak e, sapi, kambing, dan ayam bisa untuk menambah kebutuhan kami. Gitu. Ya untuk di sawah itu e, padi karena makanan pokok dan di apa itu di, di tanah pekarangan ya ada ada benana, pisang, ada ada po, ketela pohong dan saya sedikit berkebun dengan e, tanaman sengon dan jati biar nanti bisa untuk e, bila buat rumah bisa kayunya bisa untuk membuat rumah. I'm Jacob van der Hoek, 62 years old in the village where we are now, uh, where I live in Jensum, it's, it's in the middle of Friesland. It's, uh, and we live between two, three villages on, 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 the, on the countryside, between other dairy farms. And we live in the middle of our fields. We, this is a, a, a dairy farm. A dairy farm, that means that we, uh, have, we milk cows. It's a farm of 38 hectares. It's all grass. It's uh, 
we we don't change with other grass or the maize or other things. It, it, it stays grass, and we milk about 50 cows, and we do it on an organic way. I'm Peter Ham. I grew up in Santa Rita Colony, and after we went to Canada for a couple of years, then we came back here to Riva Palace, and now we live in here um, 12 years. Uh, it's my dad's farm, he's Abe Ham, and he used to grow cattle, about 120. It's so all his work he's doing. He's not really uh, planting or something, some sorgo, but the rest is just with cattle. These ones, this is just oranges, normal oranges. Like two months ago, these trees, they were all full, like all full of oranges. Time is just over. Yeah, get out. Ubi, here. Nicht der Erker hier, hier. Nein, 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 so why Peter Why you do not see my rope. I I am my life. My life, eh? So, glad in corner, any lima corner, Catis. Every many la, and that name can be six. We have seen three lima, Sabuli. They are told us we will go with Catis name, Susama. Fifteen, my other will live in the fifteen. Oh, Moop. In Bambaida, they are told you who they are, they will take it at your night. Told a day, too, some of some bad. Because there are some things that are only in the story of my sleeper. Well, yeah, I'm Jeremy Hildebrandt. Um, grew up here in the area in Altona and the farm of Luminort. And yeah, family farm there and have always been involved and have since uh, gone off into our own things as far as uh, going to school and getting an education and getting a job and always being tied to the farm and, and still having a desire to be there. And, um, yeah, we did our, our, made our first land purchase this year so we are getting more involved as time goes on and we'll see where that all takes us. Yeah, and. Uh... Well, I'm Jeremy's wife, Megan, and uh, I've also always wanted to be on a farm and be a farmer's wife, so <laughs> worked out well. Um, I was always into more of the horses side of things, and eventually our pasture kind of ran out, and that's sort of how we met, and uh, just kind of snowballed from there. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, our farm, it's a family operation. Um, we would be the fourth generation on this farm. And um, now that we're getting more involved, we're trying to find a way of, of I guess, making that our, our sole income at some point. So, I mean, we obviously we have our own land that we're, we're running now too, but we also are uh, trying to get into beekeeping and um, yeah, selling honey and all the products that come from that, the wax, and they can make slip bombs and uh, candles and that sort of stuff with it. So yeah, we try to get involved that way. And yeah, we raise chickens and all of it, uh, we're trying to get to the point where we have a number of little things that just can allow us to have have a full-time living doing what we love doing. My name is Poita Ap, 
at kum van Rusland uit de bieren je in Omsk. Doe als een nere die je daar pen in een darp wat hij te doet valt hem en aproshaft dat noemen Apollonovka. Doe als je het aan 1960 geboren als eerste kind en de familie weer bij ons een groot en een groot en een kind. En het is door en door darp opgewassen en en door darp heb ze het haat met hoofdluiten, dat komt dan niet mijn. En je hebt van ook vlecht op obert je toch, maar dat hoopte als aan dat wat hij hier thuis en en stoel kan blijven. De meeste wat zoja en jidra denkt van dat een eerste ze moet stoel buien en schwinhullen. En wanneer heeft een beet even honderd schwin, dan kan hij kan hij leven. Wanneer twee honderd schwin heeft, dan kan hij schoen leven. Als door we een dat een jidra van doorschen dag door door hand rijtje van een stoel af. Mennites began in the 16th century, both as landed people and as urban people. Persecution, in a sense, drove the urban people into the, into the countryside. And then linking with those teachings of simplicity, community nonviolence, it just seemed to work. And they found places also of freedom, exactly in places in Europe, northern Poland and southern Germany in particular, where they were not persecuted because uh, they were asked to reclaim land that had been damaged through war and so on. So they became very early on kind of folks who were known as um, who, would, who would thrive on land and who could build a community on even land that wasn't particularly sort of hospitable or land that was particularly you know, easy to get to and so on. So this is part of their sort of mythology, part of their who they are. Um, it's their folklore, it's their identity. And this carries through the centuries then, and they take this skill with them uh, in sort of this global diaspora, uh, the scattering of the people and so on. And then even the mission part of this, right, they're often these are f people who know farming. And the, uh, the early missionaries to, um, uh, known as Rhodesia at that time, Zimbabwe today, or Java, which is, you know, the former Dutch colony of Indonesia today, the independent country of Indonesia, these, far these missionaries, Relying on their past and their knowledge of agriculture would encourage their, you know, converts uh, to engage in agriculture because, again, it was assumed that this, that farming, is a place where you build good Christian community, and that's an idea that's throughout these um, various mission uh, areas as well. And so today, you find, right, you find farmers in in Mennonite communities around the world. Well, I, I, I start my day at five o'clock in the morning with milking the cows. The machine, that's uh, it's simply a, a, a pump who, who, who pumps uh, the air away, who pumps uh, a, a vacuum. And when you open this, then you have here inside this, but it, it goes also, it pumps so, a pulsation. And that, and when you put this around the teeth of the cow, it feels like you do with your hand, like this. Uh, it takes one and a half hour and to clean it, and then I, we let the cows out when they are, uh, no, it's, it's, it's nearly it's seven o'clock, the cows, they go out in the field. I feed the little calves, I give them the milk, then I clean the things in the, in the milking uh, place and in the barn, I clean things. And then I go home in, in the house for a little breakfast. Uh, when it's not very busy, I, I like to have a little sleep. And I finished one hour until nine o'clock. And then that depends on uh, yeah what it is. I, I have to do things on the field, cut grass, shake grass, make it together. This, this is all the, the silage we made this summer and it's for next winter when the cows are inside uh, uh, five or six months. When in, 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 in April the grass starts growing and, 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 and if the weather is good the cows can go out in the middle of April to eat outside and when the grass is growing about uh, so high it's about in the, in the middle of May we start cutting the first fields. 
so I, I work outside. I, I go uh, uh, in the fields for looking for wheat. I don't like wheat in the fields, so I, uh, I, 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 I go there. And then uh, at, at 12, 30, 1 o'clock, I go home for a, a lunch. And in the afternoon also, uh, I, sometimes I have to go for doing shopping or, or, or going out something or doing other work in the fields till 4.30, 5 o'clock and then I take a cup of coffee and then the day ends like the beginning with the milk and the cows, milk and the cows, feed them, feed the little calves until 7, 7.30 in the evening and then I go, I go inside to have dinner and and then at well near 11 o'clock I go to bed to sleep. A normal day in my life. I guess I, Lisa always asks me every night, "What are you doing tomorrow?" And I say, "I don't know," because I don't always know. And there's always something happens. I have to do something. So you do have more of a plan at breakfast, though. Right. Ask you I'll, I'll have a plan eventually. <laughs> I'll get up in the morning. <laughs> Maybe not have a great plan, but I'll drink coffee, read the paper, eat some cereal, think about what I need to do. Look at the weather. <laughs> Check the weather. Well, normally I'd have maybe one or two Pioneer items to do. Maybe talk to somebody, maybe do some computer work, look at some fields, do a weight check. Uh, so actually, I don't really have normal days because it changes throughout the year. Um, we may fix something in the shop. Luke would grind feed for the pigs. I would chore. First thing in the morning, I'd chore one hog building. Luke would chore the other two. Pretty much year round, every day of every week, we have to do chores somewhere. Any particular barn may be empty for a week or so between groups while we're washing it out, cleaning it out, before the next group shows up. And it's not just five days a week, it's seven days that he's out there. Sundays are a lot shorter. Um, I guess there are days, so or weeks when Sundays. Yeah, sometimes I'll try to catch depends up. Depends on what's going on. Okay, yeah, when I wake up in the morning, it's just going to the barn and start giving cows and start milking. And after, horses have to get food. And then the rest of the day, it's just like some days looking for a job, like for something else. Some days go to the store, like maybe two or three times a week. And the store is about five kilometers away from our home. They got everything like for food and for the cattle, like two. Like Got some bales on the back in the field, and like I guess like every two day after grind one bale, just go get the bale from back and start grinding it. That's not really good a very good job, but it have to be done. <laughs> a regular day def definitely varies. Um, again, with uh, the different things that we do, it all takes a different angle. The bees is something we try to do in the heat of the day. Um, so that's, yeah, around lunchtime, usually we're looking at the bees, making decisions there, and if we have to extract honey, we'll do it in the afternoon. The one re relaxing thing I find about uh, beekeeping is it's just, you're kind of forced to just be calm. They really sense your anxiety if, if you're at all rushed in a hurry or just nervous. You kind of force just to work slow and just to take it easy and it's actually really nice. A day in the life of a, just a regular harvest day, you know really there in the mornings it's um, going over the combine, going over the trucks, going over everything that's involved, uh, the tractor running the auger and just making sure everything is greased and fueled up and um, just the daily maintenance, that uh, more or less preventative maintenance, making sure everything is lined up. That's that's the morning. That usually takes all morning, because you only the harvest only starts once the dew is gone and 
community kind of figures itself out for the day, you know, usually kind of lunchtime, two o'clock, you can see combines rolling. Um, yeah, there too, once you get going, you want to go until you can't go anymore, so that's the point of the preventative maintenance in the morning. And come evening time, you know, the dew sets in again, and by that time we got to stop, and uh, yeah, more or less just getting things home and do what we can for the next day. Ya, setiap hari saya bangun uh, membantu istri di dapur uh, uh, apa itu detik geni untuk menggodok uh, air itu. Setelah itu saya uh, pergi ke walet untuk uh, matiin lampu dan kembali ke rumah lagi dan biasanya makan pagi terus langsung kerja di sawah dan setelah sawah capek siang istirahat istirahat sore cari eh, makanan sapi kambing dan setelah sampai di rumah mandi makan lihat TV dan tidur ya yeah, men and ice began as you know, what we refer to as the Anabaptist movement. This is 1525. Um, folks getting together and saying, what is faith all about? And concluding that it is about um, a conscious decision to follow the ways of Christ. And that means um, a rebaptism. So they baptize one another as adults, the most sacred ritual in, you know, the Christian religion, saying that baptism uh, needs to uh, recognize that conscious decision that you will you know be transformed in your life and so on so and this means that if you're going to follow Christ you're going to follow literally the teachings of Christ and that means the teachings of nonviolence it means the teachings of simplicity it means the teaching of living in community and so on making making taking faith and having it transform your life in, in, in the everyday. So these are the Anabaptists, and they're called Mennonites mostly because uh, 10 years after the founding, in January of 1525, uh, Dutch priest Menno Simons converts to Anabaptism, and he becomes a very prolific writer, and um, his name is, becomes associated then with, uh, with Anabaptism, because Anabaptism became a, sort of a term that was linked at that time to uh, you know, a fanatical left wing of society and so on. So with uh, Manuel Simons, uh, he, you know, folks could read his writings and realize that uh, the, the, uh, the Anabaptists that he has in mind are people who aren't there to overthrow the government, aren't fanatical and so on, but they are very committed to living sort of um, you know, living out the uh, uh, life of following Christ. They call it not follow Christi, following the ways of Christ. Many of these early Mennonites, especially in the northern Dutch region of Friesland, were dairy farmers who had lived and worked their land for generations. And over the course of time, many of these families remained in the Netherlands, farming for the most part exactly as they had for hundreds of years. Many of the Mennonites living in the Netherlands today can trace their family line back to the original Anabaptist movement in the 1500s. Our family, Van der Hoek, it's, 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 an, it's an old Mennonite family. I have a book of my family, the family Van der Hoek. And in that book, it, it goes back to 1570 until 1900. They always stayed here in this part of Friesland. And the most of them were Mennonites, were Mennonites of Protestant. And the most of them were farmer, but also a lot of them were preacher. This is what we call in Dutch an, uh, uh, a Mennonite church, and it, in, it, it was built uh, like a, a schuilkerk, a, a hidden church, because the, the Mennonites said they were, uh, it, it was forbidden to be a Mennonite in the beginning. So they, they, had, they were afraid that someone could see the church, so they built the church behind the other houses. There were all houses in front of here, and uh, later the other houses are all broken down, and now the, the, the church is in front of 
everything. You can see it. But in the time it was built, you couldn't see it. And this is the, the church himself. You see, Menno Simons, he, when you came in, Menno Simons, he looks to us. And then on Sunday, we sit in here. My place, I all, when I come in the church Sunday, my place is always here. I like to be uh, behind. I always go sit down there. Uh, most of the people, they, they, they always sit on the same place. I don't know why, but it's sometimes always they say uh, this house is filled with the, the clouds, the clouds of the words of hundreds of years, of two hundreds of years. And that, that, yeah, that, that gives me a feeling that I'm also a, a little part of that cloud. My words also and, and what I think will be part of that cloud. And maybe it will continue in, in, in the future, I don't know. In the 16th and 17th century, many Mennonites living in Europe were persecuted for their beliefs. And later, many others began running out of land because of overpopulation. Because of this, a large migration of Swiss and South German Mennonites to North America occurred during the 18th and 19th centuries. These Swiss and South German Mennonites settled in places like Pennsylvania, and by 1839 had begun farm communities in southeastern Iowa. The settlers came to be known for their corn and soybeans, and their cattle and pigs as well. Today, most of the Mennonites living in Iowa can trace their history back to Switzerland and South Germany in the 1600s. My family came to this area, I know more from my grandma Yoder's side. She lived grew up in a house, two houses, about a quarter of a mile from here and then one up the hill where Luke and Rachel lived when she was young, uh, a kid. Her parents died when she, when she was how old, a teenager? Yeah. So her and her older brother kind of raised the rest. Her older brother was probably the boss, I'm sure. Uh, so she, her family grew up right here and her you know, her ancestors kind of settled it here, I guess. Mm -hmm. So this is my grandparents, Yoder on the Yoder side, Louis and Arvilla. And Arvilla's name, they always called her Maudie for some reason. I don't know why. Um, so they would have grown up, Grandma Yoder would have grown up in Lynn and Brian's house just across the field and also up the hill half a quarter of a mile where Luke and Rachel live, my daughter and son-in-law. So we're all kind of in a Yoder community there. Yeah, but mo a lot of the people from here that way I remember being in church when I was a kid. So that actually the church has changed a lot in 40 to 50 years that I can remember. There's very few of the older generation left anymore. While the Swiss Mennonites migrated westward to North America, many of the Dutch Mennonites moved eastward to northern Poland and later to the southern reaches of the Russian Empire in present-day Ukraine. Here they reproduced the village lifestyle that they had once had in the Netherlands. And for many years, they thrived under the rule of the Russian government. But as pressure from the Russian government to provide military service began to mount, many of the Mennonites began to look for a new home. And in the 1870s, a mass migration of Mennonites from Russia to North America began. The settlers moved to Kansas, Nebraska, and other places in the American Midwest, and to Manitoba in Western Canada. The Mennonites themselves, they, they settled this area, I believe, in 1874. Um, yeah, I mean, they were there was different flushes of migrations that came through over the years. Uh, but my family, all sides of my family came in the 1874 migration. That was from, from um, uh, Russia, Prussia, I guess, kind of Ukraine area. Um, and they left that because of persecution. So they came here, this is where they settled. And, 
yeah, I mean, it's all sides of my family settled in the area here, all on the West Reserve. And, um, yeah, only my grandpa on my mom's side, was the, that was the only family that left, uh, left to go to Mexico. And they eventually came back. And like most families back then, they left and sold everything off. And the ones that came back, came back with nothing and had to try to make ends meet and make a go of things. Yeah, when we family history, family line came down from Russia, this is where or Ukraine, wherever. This is uh, this is where we originally settled. Um, the Hildebrand line, anyways. This is where my great-grandfather would have grown up. But since then, he got married and, and uh, they settled in Blumenort. I know my dad's parents, they came from Mexico. Uh, they ended up in Ontario for a few years and they ended up over here in Manitoba when my dad was 12 or so, something like that. A few decades after many Mennonites moved west from Russia to North America, many others decided to move east. These migrations took place in the decades around the turn of the 20th century, and the settlers moved to places south and west of Omsk, Siberia. And this village life changed dramatically in 1917 with the Russian Revolution and eventual collectivization of all farming. On starp vu etsi yeburo, dot asi grindet on nineteen alf. Dot vire fish families. Da komu von ein darp von Ukraine dot vine tochter keleni von Khortitsa. And in uto darp dot et mi fiesta al zante miste je komu ok ne her nach hando no dot uba on van komu fish families doi habe dot darp je grindet. Da komu ab Lohn suche. Der wird nicht zu Hand geschickt. Dort ist von meiner Mutter ihre Kunde. So ist eine Sibirien gekommen. Und ihr ähm, Großvater und Großmutter, die sind dann da hingekommen. Ja. So ist die Bure. Ihre Mutter ist auch die Bure in Fuda in diesem Darb, wo sie lebt. Und dann auch ich. Ja. Und ich sehe die Bure in der Zeit als ein Darb wie Kalchos. Dort wird es anders als Kalchos. Wie es kalt war, dass man dann hörte, dass alles töpfen, wenn es Jahr zu Ende war, dann deutete sie in jedem Teil von dort, wo man dann töpfen ackert hat. Mein Vater ging jeden Tag ab Arbeit, muss aufschaffen, mindestens acht Stunden, so ja vorkommen viel mehr. Wo ich nicht konnte denken, auch nach von Tlin, wieder so ja vorkommen von Tlin zu morgen ins Wach, und kommen laut ab und noch und tritt. Dort kauf bloß im Winter mal, ein freier Tag, dort wird Sündag sein. Sonst mussten jeder Arbeit und im Sauchhaus schaffen, äh, jeder Tag. Im Sommer in der Erntezeit, im Sommer in der Hofst, wird man schaffen, der Runde wird, und geht bloß, wenn drei Jahre dort, dann kommt man zuerst sein. Dort wird dann ausgenutzt, um irgendwo zu stehen. Ja. In the early 1900s, many of the Mennonites living in Manitoba and Saskatchewan became dissatisfied with their government as legislation changed, making publicly inspected English language schools mandatory for all children. Because of this, a large group of Mennonites moved to Mexico and Paraguay in an effort to maintain their way of life, separate from government interference. These communities took root, but in time, modern ways and scarcity of land quickly became an issue. So, in the late 1960s, a large group of old colony Mennonites from Mexico moved southward to Bolivia to start new horse and buggy colonies there. My, uh, my grandfather, he was uh, John Ham. He, he came from Mexico when my dad was 11 years old. They, then they came here to Rio Palacio to live in, in 18. And that's where my dad grew up until they got married. And then he went to Canada to make some money to come back. And he had only the fence he had over here. So he sold everything in Santa Rita. And then he started on this uh, farm here. He had only one, uh, 50 acres here. When he got here, he started buying more like up to, he had it up to like 350 acres. And right now like, get Mary, me and my brother and sister, we all get 50, no, 25 acres, like. So Mennonite settlers migrated from Western Europe, eastward to Russia, 
westward to North America and southward to South America. And in the late 1800s, with the rise of the modern missionary movement, many Mennonites also began to travel to Asia and the Pacific to convert people to the faith and build Mennonite church communities. They traveled to places like China and India, and in 1851, a Dutch missionary named Peter Jans traveled to Indonesia, where his son later founded the Mennonite mission farm village of Magarejo. Untuk tentang sejarah keluarga, kalau leluhur saya kurang tahu yang setahu saya itu dari orang tua kakek saya itu asalnya dari Jepara dan setelah pindah di Margorjo dan kakek saya menurunkan ayah saya dan ayah saya setelah menjadi pekerja gereja dan dikasih tempat yang saya tempati ini dan saya teruskan dengan saya ini saya saya sebagai anaknya dan saya menempati ini tidak uh, boleh untuk menjual tapi untuk uh, menempati selamanya dan saya harus uh, bergereja di GTC Margorjo. In addition to Asia and the Pacific, many Mennonite missionaries travel to Africa to start new churches. And in the 1890s, Brethren in Christ missionaries from the United States headed for southern Africa, where they began a mission farm in the community of Motopos in southern Rhodesia, in what is today Zimbabwe. Ndumelikuwa <laughs> Kulenda <laughs> Uh, as a kid growing up, mom was always a stay-at-home mom, took care of us all day long. Uh, dad was the one bringing home the bacon. He worked all the long hours and stuff like that. Um, yeah, uh, that's pretty much all there was to that, I don't know. Yeah, for me, I guess um, mom was always, always had a job as well, um, again with the farm just uh, didn't really work to have her at home so uh, mom was yeah at a job and she was at at home whenever she could be and we did have some babysitters over the years too and if not that we were just with dad on the farm and, and dad too he was always farming but he also was a, was a school bus driver um, did that for many years and there too yeah dad was uh, I guess they both contributed to the home um, but dad was still always kind of the you know, the dad, you know, this, the, we're going to get in trouble when dad gets home sort of mentality, you know, he's always the, you know, the last line of defense, and uh, in that regard, very typical home, that way, um, nothing different from anyone else, I don't think. My mom took care of the house and the kids and um, the gardens, and, and dad worked hard, because <laughs> there were seven kids, so. He had a hard time he had two keeping. Jobs. He had two All jobs. Two jobs, yeah. Yeah, so they definitely had different roles. Yeah, it'd be similar to me. My dad did all the farm work, with, along with all the boys, which would included they helped, but I'm sure he also had to 
show them everything, teach them everything, watch over them out there. And then mom was in charge, you know, of the house, the laundry, cooking, uh, cleaning, garden, which was a huge job because there was <laughs> 10 people. So she would actually usually have one or two of the boys help. But yeah, they kind of had defined roles. And my dad did probably all the check writing and bookkeeping for the farm. My mom did the grocery shopping. I got five sisters, two brothers. My brother Abe is not married yet, and he's just working too here on the farm. And the sisters, they're all working like more inside, just like inside, but when it comes to milking, they come morning time, night time to come help milking. But uh, the rest of the day, they're more like washing, making food inside, uh, making clothes, stay more inside though. Saya mempunyai kenangan dari bapak saya. Bapak saya adalah orang tua yang paling tanggung jawab dan sayang kepada keluarga. Bila mana ibu saya itu sedang sakit, ayah saya mengerjakan pekerjaan dari ibu itu. Apa saja, ya, misalnya pekerjaan perempuan itu bisa mengerjakan semua. Ya, masa cuci itu itu dilaksanakan oleh bapak saya. Dia pas waktu sakit, dulunya kan e, ibu saya sering sakit-sakitan. Gitu. Well, this is the the grave of my wife Yanka. Sometimes I sit here for some minutes and yeah. It's a good, it's a good, good place to be here. It's quiet, and, and you are in the middle of the village, but you you don't see a uh, person, so it's quiet here. It also it it will be my place. Don't know when, and because I did, the, the, we 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 have to buy a place like this, and I bought I bought it for two persons. So once I will also rest here. Yeah, we pray about a lot of things. I mean, uh, for us, aside from the farm, I mean, it's it's family and friends, and um, we try to, you know, you we, we pray for you know, on the bigger perspective too. I mean, for the country, for the nation, and and just for different sides, you know, things that are going on. But yeah, I mean, down to the farm, we pray for um, healthy crops, healthy yeah animals. Yeah, healthy livestock, healthy crops. Just again, also being thankful for what we have, and you know, for the weather systems that move through, that they weren't worse, or whatever the case is. You know, I mean, we try to try to keep that perspective going. Um, always being thankful, but still praying for God's blessing on what we do. We try to avoid praying for for stuff like good weather and and things that. That we know God will eventually, like He will take care. You know, He knows our needs. He'll provide for our needs, and that's not something that we need to always, always put in front of Him. You know, because He knows our needs, and we we try to rely on that. Still, being thankful for all that He has done, even weather-wise. <laughs> Mother's 
being on that side. Yeah, you can pencil out any, anything you want and make it look good, but farming is still risky, uh, risky and you have to have hope and faith that you know over the long haul it'll turn out. Uh, and it almost always works out one way or another. I think, boy, this we're kind of in a bind financially, or we're not going to get this work done, or you know, it does. This, I don't know how we're going to get through this situation. It always seems to work out mm -hmm. somehow, some way. Either somebody helps us, or all of a sudden things start to click and work together. Uh, I don't know if that's faith or not, but. Setiap saat, setiap malam kami berdua pertama untuk keluarga, untuk anak-anak saya supaya uh, bertumbuh berkembang dengan baik dan selalu setur dengan kehendak Tuhan dan kami berdoa untuk uh, jemaat supaya lebih uh, cinta kepada Tuhan, lebih berbakti kepada Tuhan dan setiap saat kami berdoa untuk setiap tanaman saya biar dapat membuahkan dengan baik dan semua itu bisa diberkati oleh Tuhan. One time Jesus was on a place and he was telling stories to people and there were yeah, hundreds of thousands of people listening to him and they forget all the time and then it was evening and the disciples said to Jesus, "Oh, it's nearly night and all the all those people here what must they eat? We have nothing to eat for them. Then Jesus said, go around and look what here is. And they go around with a basket and they get five fishes and, 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 and three breads or something. And Jesus said, go around and give everyone to eat. And they said, oh, that's impossible. What's five fishes and three breads for a thousand men? And they, they went around and they divided it everyone eat and everyone was satisfied and the rest also a lot and then I say so if you divide all the food on an honest way and you don't spoil it then there is always enough even on an organic way it's not a question of uh, use lots of, of fertilizer and, and lots of other chemicals to produce lots and lots of foods, but you have to divide it in a good way. And then even on an organic way, you can cultivate and produce enough food for everyone. And that's, that's always a story that, yeah, that's a story that, 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 that uh, how, do you, how do you call it? That, yeah, my ideology that, that uh, production of, of food is not it's, it's not the way of producing much more and more and more but do it in an honest and good way and it, 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 it is possible farming feeds the world uh, people are reliant on food uh, ultimately for the world that's why it's important I mean it's important for Mennonites for various other reasons I mean farming brings people together in common endeavor but ultimately, uh, we, we rely on food. Um, and uh, we will in the future rely on food from healthy soil healthy, and healthy, a healthy earth. And so um, farming is uh, at the core of the survival of humankind. Well, farming is important to me because you know, it's what I've always done, I love to do. It's also a way to feed the people in the world. I mean, and I'm always striving to do the best I can, produce the most, not only to make money to survive, but to feed people, mm -hmm. you know, the most economic way we can. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't have farming and all the land is used for other purposes, I don't know, we'd starve pretty quickly. And I don't know if people in the city realize where everything comes from, you know, they think, probably think 
pork chop or a steak comes from the store, I don't know, or a chicken breast. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's important, but maybe the rest of people don't understand well, what we do or why it's important. And it's, I think as farmers you feel like it's a privilege, too, to be able to farm. Because not, ever, not everybody is able to farm, and so you want to do the best right. that you can at it. Right. It's, yeah, there's very few people that actually get to farm. Mm -hmm. Or even get a chance. We're called to take care of what God has given us. If you're faithful with little, you'll be entrusted with much. And that's kind of the mentality that we're, we're trying to go into this. You know, we are definitely on the smaller scale, but if we can be faithful in it, who knows where we'll end up? You know, I mean, that's, again, something that's out of our control. Karena pertani itu sangat penting, Pak, karena kalau tidak ada petani, kemungkinan orang tidak bisa hidup karena itu uh, bisa untuk makan setiap orang hasil dari pertanian itu sangat penting farming is more than than a job farming it's a way of living and it's it's the whole whole thing together that i like the, the way of living outside working outside working with animals, working with the seasons, working with the weather, sometimes happy with the weather, sometimes unhappy with the weather, but always, uh, and, and, and not a day is the same. Some, uh, uh, in the morning you start working inside, milking the cows, over the day you work outside in the fields, then you have the cows, and uh, in the summer you have the, the, the work in the fields, in the winter, you have more time free to do things you like, so it it, it, it changes always, and all that things together, that's that, that that way of living. That's that's what I like. Uh, Mennonites, in their history, have been a disproportionately rural people. It doesn't matter where where you find them. There's a story of agriculture there, and they have faced agricultural issues um, through a particular cultural lens. And that lens speaks about community uh, and communities through the generations. It speaks about nonviolence and living peacefully uh, amongst the people. It talks about um, you know the basics of life. You know what's what's good and what's worthy and what's simple and what can survive. So in history, watching these people over time uh, through the course of the 20th century, ask these questions as they, as a people of nonviolence and community, have bumped into. Uh, global issues, whether it's technology, whether it's uh, chemicalized farming, whether it's global markets, um, but bear, bringing that sort of those religious values uh, or a culture that's informed by these Anabaptist ideas uh, into conversation with these global issues, these environmental challenges, um, that's their history and uh, maybe we can all learn from um, knowing more about that history.